All right, let's get going. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Nagel. I'm one of the uh, committee members of the uh, online fellow curriculum committee. Um, and uh, we're pretty excited today to have Chad Carlson and Brian Williams join us for a discussion on medical legal aspects of sports medicine. Um, Chad is, uh, <clears throat> is wonderful to have uh, Chad be willing to give this, uh, give this talk. He's been on the board of directors of AMSSM for, for a number of years, has been involved with the, uh, specifically with the practice and policy uh, committee um, of AMSSM was author of the Sports Medicine Licensure Clarity Act as well. He's the immediate past president of AMSSM um, and still is on the executive uh, committee uh, for I think one more year. Is that correct, Chad? About six months. So six months. Okay. Um, but he's he's been very involved with with policy, also with ACSM. And then joining Chad, we have uh, Brian Williams, who is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the American, uh, for AMSSM. Um, he works with the Practice and Policy Committee, uh, AMSSM leadership um, to lead the AMSSM policy and advocacy efforts in each state, as well as Washington, D.C. He has served in similar roles for a number of other organizations, um, National Center for Policy Analysis, American Public Health Association, and has also worked on congressional staffs for a number of representatives and senators in the past. So together, they're going to take us through a uh, discussion of medical legal aspects of sports medicine. For uh, any of you guys uh, in the audience, if you uh, would like to um, ask any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I would be, afterwards, we will have a Q&A session um, and more than happy to, to relay those in. Um, and hopefully this will help some with the RCAQ exam prep as well, as well as just giving you some pearls um, for a variety of, of issues that may come up in practice as well. So Chad and Brian, thank you so much for being willing to be with us today. Really appreciate it. All right, now how do I take this screen? I will stop sharing mine and it sh you should be able to share yours now with, uh, down at the bottom. All right. You see that okay? That's perfect. All right. Well, I, I want to just uh, take just a second to thank everybody because you, you all gave me a chance to actually wear a tie again, which has been a long time in coming. And I'm just pleased that I was able to remember how to tie the knot. So um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's always good to uh, have an opportunity to speak to physicians and training. I think that it's the responsibility of those of us who are more seasoned to try to help you along and smooth the way in ways that we can. So I'm happy to do this and hopefully you'll learn a little bit from what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I was asked to speak about sports medicine and the law. That's a pretty broad subject. So I'm gonna try to keep this as relevant as I can along what I think might be relevant for you. I'm gonna stay away from the obvious stuff. So, you know, I'm not gonna, get into don't sexually abuse your patients, that sort of thing. Um, we're gonna try to break down things that you will experience in the course of your, uh, your medical career and uh, what sorts of things to think about, particularly as you start to take on more um, responsibility in the course of your job. I used uh, a lot of those, the uh, resources that I used came out of uh, the Marquette Sports Law Institute and specifically their review. And I just wanna, I threw this up here because I want to make you aware of it. It's freely accessible on the web and it's a great journal and uh, the content in it is almost all relevant to stuff that you're gonna be doing. And uh, so it's, it's just good to thumbnail and uh, reference to, if you have legal questions about stuff that you're doing, you'll probably be able, be able to find cited answers um, in, in that content. Matt Mitten from Marquette is uh, the head of that department and has done a lot. He's sp spoken at our meetings before, but it's a good res resource. So, uh, you know, what, why do we care about the law? Um, you know, I'm not an attorney and I know that uh, most of you are not either. Um, I think that first of all, uh, we, we need to remember that we need to be able to, we need to be positioned to do our jobs the best way that we can. And part of that is to, that we do have a duty to be informed. Uh, my kids are all 
classically educated, so they take Latin. So I, I cleared my pronunciation of this with them. But there's an old Latin phrase that says, ignorantia juris non excusat. And that means that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Um, that's important because uh, you're responsible for, for the law, whether you realize it or not, uh, realize that it exists. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, why do we, why is it important to follow the law? Well, you know, first of all, you have a, you have a duty to your patients and that duty is really, it, it has to do with providing the guardrails for society to function properly. Um, these, these rules, if we're going to take for a given that the law is good, and in most cases it is, these laws exist for a reason. And you'll see this as we go through this. Most of the time, these, you know, the laws that exist have their basis in mistakes that have been made. And so, um, you know, it is our, part of our duty to our patients is to abide by the laws that are in front of us. But there's also a duty to self. And, uh, and outside of just um, self-interest and self-preservation, uh, because of the fact that most of these, these rules exist to protect the public and to make things better, um, if you're aware of them, in most cases, it'll make you a better doctor. And uh, so keep this in mind as we're going through this, you know, you don't want to be the one that's making the mistake that leads to a law that ends up serving others. You want to learn your lesson from the mistakes of other people. Um, I, uh, I, I just finished the licensing process in the state of Texas because of uh, a business venture that we're, we're working on. And part of that state's process is that you have to take a you have to take a written exam in the law in Texas as pertains to medicine. It's a hard exam. And it got me thinking that, uh, you know, I, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that um, it's, it's actually important for you to consider um, the law in your own area as it touches on what you're going to be doing professionally. And so um, I'd encourage you, once you know where you're going, to spend some time thinking about this and just making yourself aware of, of the, the laws that are specific to the state that you're in. So this talk, we're going we're gonna to just walk through some cl common clinical and practice scenarios, and we're going to look at some of the legal issues surrounding them and then try and figure out what's applicable to you. Um, in terms of sports medicine, I think that it's important that you realize that um, if you're taking care of athletes that are um, visible in the public eye that you're exposing yourself to more liability than you would be if you were doing something else. And so that's evidenced by the fact that litigation related to sports medicine continues to increase uh, year on year. And so, you know, there's a, there's a fun aspect to doing what we do with athletes on the field, but we also have to keep in mind that we need to watch our backs too. When you're, when you're responsible for the care that goes on on a field or in the locker room, you need to just keep in mind that there's a, that when, if something comes up, whether or not you are adhering to the accepted standard of care is gonna be vital to whether or not you're able to successfully defend what happened. And then and the, it's important to point out that the standard of care does vary from place to place. You know, there's not really a national standard of care in most cases. The standard is both regionally and nationally established. So for instance, um, the type of uh, program that you might have to mitigate heat risk might look different in Miami than it would in International Falls, Minnesota. Or if you're working on um, COVID uh, safety uh, protocols, in an area where there's almost no penetrance of the disease, it's gonna look different than if you were in New York City in April. So, um, you know, being aware of your surroundings is important, uh, but using uh, some uniform standards is also, knowing what the uniform standards might be that you might be uh, responsible for are important too. And, and honestly, uh, figuring that out, there's a little bit of an art to it. But, um, when you're, again, if you're in a position where you're being asked to set something up for the, your employer or for um, 
or a university. Um, these, any kind of written policy and procedure that you put together ought to be created with these standards in mind. And so things like, you know, what is the, the hierarchy of care um, for athletes that uh, is gonna be optimal? You know, what's the chain of command look like? Does the athletic trainer that's working with you report to the physician or does, it, is, does that athletic trainer report to the athletic director? You know, what are minimum staffing expectations for event coverage? Um, when you're looking at safety protocols and trying to decide what's best, um, these are going to be location specific as well. Um, you know, according to the venue that you're in or the place of the country that you're in. Again, if we're talking about heat um, risk, it's going to look different in one area of the country than another. And again, we've kind of touched base on this, but you know, we these procedures need to have some flexibility based on changing conditions as well. So. Um, COVID is a great example, you know, the disease fluctuates in, uh, in terms of uh, prevalence at any given time. And so your, your behavior around that may look a little bit different depending on what's going on at any given time. So um, I thought I'd start with Good Samaritan laws. Um, I think it's important to say that, you know, these laws, the first question to be asked, I guess, is, you know, is this, is this, an anticipated or an unanticipated event. You know, um, these laws mostly apply to the provision of emergency care only. They vary by state. So, for those of you who don't know, Good Samaritan Law is a, it's a law that uh, provides some level of immunity for uh, Good Samaritans who come to the aid of somebody in, in an emergency situation who's been injured or is in need. Um, what you might not know is that um, most states don't require you to go to the aid of some, somebody in distress, but some do. Um, I've listed a few there, Minnesota, Rhode Island, and Vermont. So um, that's important to know. Um, but in the end, so we'll, we'll talk in a minute about, you know, what constitutes uh, a duty to care. Um, but this sort of evidence is back to the fact that you really need to know your, your state the laws of the state that you're in, um, hopefully most of us would want to go to the aid of somebody that was in need. But uh, as to whether you have a duty or not, some states do vary. Um, keep in mind that if your patient is unconscious, there's implied consent almost uniformly. Um, if the patient's conscious, uh, you really, it's important that you ask that for permission to treat. Um, unless it's a child, then you're given leeway. Um, again, is this anticipated or unanticipated? Why is that important? Well, um, most laws don't protect you if you're acting in the context of your job. So um, even as a volunteer, as a team physician, um, you may end up uh, having to defend your actions um, even if you're not compensated. Um, this Weiss versus Pratt case was uh, a case where an orthopedic surgeon was covering a football game. Um, a player went down with symptoms um, uh, of neck pain on the field. Um, he was clinically cleared on the field, um, taken out of the game, and then uh, I believe discharged home, ended up having a, a spinal cord epidural hematoma and then developed some permanent upper extremity weakness. The physician was sued. Um, so again, you know, just we sometimes think that that uh, the fact that we're not getting paid for the coverage that we're providing might provide us protection. It won't necessarily. You need to make sure that you're you're clear with what your state does say or doesn't say. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, if you're doing event coverage, a lot of these events have general liability insurance policies. Um, a lot of times, those policies do not include medical liability coverage. So you wanna make sure if somebody's asking you to, um, to uh, provide medical coverage for these events that they're either providing um, separate medical liability riders or that you're informing your own malpractice carrier of what you're doing so that uh, you can either purchase a rider or your employer can do it for you. Um, we, we went down to uh, Tennessee a couple years ago and we went whitewater rafting as a family and we had to sign waivers that basically removed all liability from us for any any kind of negligence on the part of the operator. So that's always 
something that uh, you know, makes you pause before you sign something like that. But the reality is, is that these pre-signed medical liability waivers are usually not legally enforceable because they don't protect against gross negligence. Um, and that's the same with us. Um, you know, we, uh, liability waivers that athletes might sign prior to a mass event or something like that doesn't waive your um, uh, responsibility to provide at least the minimum standard of care. So back to, is there a duty to treat? Um, some states, as I said, do have implied duty to treat in their law. There's not very many of them, but there are a few. Um, are you on call um, or uh, um, you know, are you required to provide some level of emergency care within the, the uh, job that uh, you're currently engaged in? Um, are you, is the person that, uh, you know, was in an emergency situation already your patient. Um, there's the issue of compensation. If you're not compensated for uh, on the field care, I don't think it, it doesn't necessarily completely eliminate you from liability, but if you are being compensated for it, um, generally that will be considered as removing your protection. And I think you have to be careful about accepting even items with minimal value um, because uh, that could be constituted, that could be considered um, as a form of compensation. Um, even just having an, an agreement to treat. So, and this kind of goes back to, uh, you know, if you're a team physician, you're not being paid for something. If, you, if there's an actual um, written formal agreement for you to be the team doc, you're essentially providing a duty that you were contracted for, regardless of your pay. Um, all states but Kentucky offer reciprocal immunity for a physician to treat. So if you're from Tennessee and you're in Kentucky um, and, and you come across a, an accident, um, you have to be aware of that. You, you may not, um, you're not considered allowable to practice medicine in that situation. So uh, your, your standard of emergency response would be community standard. Um, I, I threw this in here too, because you might not be aware of it, but um, if something happens while you're in the air um, on a charter flight or something like that, um, there is immunity that the federal government has provided for you to provide assistance to a passenger in distress. Um, and all planes are required to be stocked with uh, first aid kits, an AED, and uh, some emergency uh, equipment as well. And not only that, but uh, all the flight crews are trained in CPR, and there's always a ground communication system that will connect you to an on-call emergency position. So you'll always have somebody to kind of walk you through um, the management of whatever is going on if, if in fact um, a situation like that arises. Um, medical coverage across state lines. Um, this sort of speaks to the, um, license team, uh, the Licensure Clarity Act that we passed a couple of years ago. Um, what that was, was basically, there, there had been a patchwork of state laws uh, regulating what was allowable for a physician who was crossing state lines with the team and what their status was in terms of care of their team being allowable. At the time that we started this process, there was only about 17 states that allowed some form of reciprocity. And um, at some point, we, we canvassed malpractice insurers, and we found that the malpractice insurers generally were all over the place in terms of what they would allow as well. Um, and once we realized that, we realized that the state fixes were not the only way that we could that we were able to address this because um, states uh, can't tell an, an insurance company that's, that's housed out of their state that they need to cover a position in their state. So, um, so we continued to support a state-by-state -state approach. And at this point, I, I, don't, I've, I don't keep track of it anymore, but I believe there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 something states that now um, have legislated reciprocity into their medical practice acts. And what I mean by that is just that, you know, as a physician in Iowa, if I was going to Kansas, um, Kansas's medical practice act would say that 
for the duration of the time that I'm in the state, as long as I'm rendering care to my team, I'm exempt from the, the uh, mandates of the Kansas Pract uh, Medical Practice Act. They're assuming that I'm licensed in the state that I'm in um, and that I'm contracted with my team. The Sports Medicine Licensure Clarity Act simply um, blanketed this um, nationally and it also addressed the issue with malpractice. So um, the requirements to, to be triggered by that bill are that one, you have a contractual agreement with your team and that two, um, you're, you've notified your malpractice insurer prior to crossing state lines with that team. And as long as you are doing that, um, we believe that uh, you're, you're clean from a malpractice standpoint. Um, pharmacology issues are implied when you're going across state lines too. Um, it's important to keep in mind that there are dual, you know, we live in a federal republic, so there's dual sovereignty at any given time, especially when it comes to medicine. And so the transportation of controlled substances across state lines, it, it, it invokes both federal and state authority. And uh, so you have to be aware, again, um, of uh, state-based rules, but in general, um, controlled substances can only be dispensed from locations where you have the authority granted already to dispense them from. So that's, you, that's a no-no to take uh, um, really any form of controlled substances on the road with you. Um, so you need to consider pre-dispensing these to your patient prior to travel if somebody really needs something like that, or you need to have an arrangement with the uh, visiting staff wherever you're going. Um, they have tried to legislate this. Pete Sessions, who uh, was voted out of office um, from Congress uh, two years ago, and then I think just got reelected, probably be back in Congress again in January, has tried to champion this, but it's never passed. But basically what this bill that he has promoted um, would do would be to allow for the a limited period of time to transport controlled substances with a team um, for 72 hours um, as an exemption to dispense from uh, a single site. It would let you dispense from a team hotel or a team training room or something like that. Um, but uh, it's important to emphasize that is not the law right now. Um, right now, uh, you, as I said, you either have to pre-dispense prior to travel or you need to delegate that to a different medical staff to from wherever you're going. Um, in terms of medical coverage internationally, um, you know, what is the rule where if you're going to another country with a team from a national governing body, um, you know, this is obviously a common answer, but uh, the rules are going to vary all over the map. Um, I put a link up here that, uh, and Andy, I, I suppose uh, maybe we can get that link out to people at some point, but uh, this was a survey in 2013 that um, PIMS is an international sports medicine body did to survey 24 countries and just look at their medical policies for physicians coming in from other countries. And it's kind of a nice document. It just, it just is a easy to read compendium of the policies in these countries, at least as of seven years ago. But that, the point is that, that uh, you, know, you do need to be aware of the policy of the country that you're going into because it is going to most likely vary. Um, PIMS recommends the approach taken by the World Rowing Association. Um, this organization requires physicians to submit material for credentialing through their NGV. And so because that approach is then uniform, uh, they're able to take the list of the physicians that are covering for them and use that to demand waivers for temporary licensing requirements from any country that wants to host the world championships for, in this case, rowing. And so for those of you who either are already involved with care of an NGV team or uh, might in the future, that's something to pay attention to. And, uh, and I think and that, does, that approach does make sense because um, in the absence of uniformity of international law, it's one way to the, the, the um, it's one way to give the host country some idea that uh, there's a certain and specific medical standard that's being 
um, held to um, on the part of the physicians that are coming in to provide coverage. I don't know if you remember Wes Leonard, but Wes Leonard was a, a basketball player, a high school basketball player in the state of Michigan, who uh, it's been several years ago now, but uh, he was, he was uh, playing in, um, I think the last regular season game of his high school season. And he, he scored a layup to go ahead and win the game and uh, hoisted off uh, by his teammates. Um, to the center of the court and then a minute later collapsed. He had uh, right ventricular dysplasia um, and he, uh, he ended up dying. And I, I, I threw this up there just because this is an example of um, where chain of command wasn't really properly considered. And so, uh, you know, once he went down, uh, there, the emergency response that that uh, was triggered was inadequate. Um, there was a nurse on duty. There was a nurse in the stands. Um, she found the principal. Uh, the principal ran back to where he thought the AED was. It wasn't in its proper place on the wall. They rummaged around. They, I, I believe they couldn't get into the, it was in the nurse's office and the nurse's office was locked. Um, they finally found it buried under some stuff in that room, got it out in, into the gym. Um, got the pads on him and then found out that the battery was dead. And so, um, again, just a sort of a chain of, of uh, errors that didn't, didn't cause his cardiac arrest, but um, arguably contributed to um, the outcome. Uh, think about these sorts of things when you're setting up your systems to provide emergency care, because um, and we'll talk about this. There's a duty now to anticipate this. I think that's pretty well established in the law. Um, this Kleinneck versus Gettysburg College um, involved the death of a lacrosse player. And at the time, and remember what I was talking about, that most of these cases arise and laws from them arise because of um, you know, mistakes on the part of a school or a, a provider. But at the time that this, this uh, athlete went down, there was no trainer or student athletic trainer on site. There was no coach present. He was trained in CPR. Uh, this was 1993, so there was no phone present on site. And so um, this case is generally agreed to have established that risk to a student athlete participating in their sport is foreseeable. That's important. So you have to, you have to think about the fact that these sudden cardiac events, arrest events, or you know, heat uh, injury or head injuries, things like that, they're an inherent risk of participation in the sport, but they are foreseeable. You can't claim that you didn't have systems in place because you just didn't think that it was, the chances of, of it were happening were high enough. And so institutions have to anticipate this and they have to take appropriate precautions including now appropriate emergency action plans. And so, you know, organizing this process and documenting the process, and again, going back and making sure that the process is anchored in what we know is the appropriate standard of care, that's, that's on whoever's responsible for putting this together. Always document all care provided to your injured athletes. Um, so, the law at the time that this, this athlete uh, went down was that um, they were supposed to have an AED within, it was, actually wasn't the law, it was the State High School Athletic Association's policy that they were supposed to have an AED within three minutes of, of the athlete at any given time. And I liked this, uh, this news report because it showed an overhead view of the campus and where the athlete went down and where the different AEDs were um, supposed to be and the protocol just again wasn't being followed. So you can have an emergency action plan and it can be on paper can look tight, but you have to, you have to make sure that it, everybody's aware of it first of all, and that it's being followed. And you're not always gonna be on site. You're gonna have people that are basically running this for you at times, especially during practices and things like that. And um, you, you know, it's, it's in your legal interest to make sure that the protocols that are put in place are actually being adhered to. 
So when you're putting together your emergency action plan, you need to think about, again, things like what staffing look like at times where there aren't games going on, but there are sanctioned activities going on. Is there a trainer present or not? If not, does the coach that's present know CPR? Um, where, are, where are the uh, AEDs? Where is safety equipment? Is it within a reasonable distance, meaning, you know, in this case, within three minutes or less of um, where that athlete is? Are there uh, communication pathways set up? Um, keep this stuff in mind because this stuff ultimately, again, because you, you are considered legally to have a duty to anticipate these problems is gonna be your responsibility. All right, heat illness, we're talking about the same, same types of things. We need to be able to anticipate the fact that these things can happen. They, the risks do vary depending on the region of the country that you're in. But with this particularly, since prevention is the best treatment for this condition, creating these pre-established risk mitigation strategies is the best treatment and your best legal defense in the case that something catastrophic does happen. Um, so again, um, looking at where this can go wrong, um, in this particular case, this athlete uh, uh, developed symptoms of heat stroke, the physician on duty was unavailable, no medical providers were called until the athlete had actually been unconscious for an hour and a half, and uh, medical care wasn't even begun until two hours after the athlete became ill. That's obviously not how we're trained, um, and I think I'd like to say that that sort of thing probably wouldn't happen again, but you just don't know, and the 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 more defined your emergency action plan is, and the more integrated the people that are working under you are to implementing it, you know, not only does an outcome like this have less of a chance of occurring, but you're more defensible and if something is to happen. As far as head injuries, um, you know, we're, we're developing a long chain of litigation around this. Um, a, a couple landmark cases that I guess I'd touch on um, one of the first ones was in 1951, this Rosenzweig versus New York. This was a ring physician who returned a boxer to the ring who had had, it was actually a TKO and then a KO within the previous three weeks and um, subsequently died of what was probably second impact syndrome. Um, but uh, this, this established the uh, idea that um, you have to ground your medical decisions in um, I think uh, what we would consider um, a usual standard of practice. Schmitz versus the NCAA um, was a uh, former Notre Dame football player who didn't really know he had problems until he was into his 50s and then he developed symptoms that were supposedly consistent with CTE. Uh, he ended up dying and the family sued the NCAA um, and the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that the statute of limitations for this actually starts after the diagnosis is made, not the date of injury. Um, and for something like CTE, um, that's a real issue, you know. So, and, and I think one of the reasons why the NCAA was named in the suit was just because, you know, when you're talking about something that's happening 30 years after the fact, a lot of times the physicians that were treating no longer around. So um, this just raises all kinds of legal worms um, in terms of malpractice risk and is a, is a major issue right now, um, but it's something to keep an eye on. And it's something to talk to your malpractice carriers about too, um, especially when you're taking care of and making decisions with uh, athletes that you know may not realize they have a problem until you know, 30 years from now. Um, Swank versus Valley Christian School. Um, is a case that was decided in Washington State a couple of years ago, and I threw this in here because that case um, was directly um, decided because of perceived failure to follow the tenets of the Zach Lyset law, which, if you remember, the state of Washington was the first state to create a concussion law that is somewhat similar to the states, to the laws that exist in most states today, and um, I think even though you can't translate a decision by the Washington courts into other states, you can anticipate that other states may rule in similar ways, which is that the failure, that, that the law itself creates an implied cause of action and that when we're talking about 
these state-based laws where you have to remove an injured athlete from the field of play and, um, and provide them with concussion information, injury on head injury or information on head injury, and then make sure that they're screened by a clinician prior to the return to play, um, that you're gonna be held to that standard because the law itself creates that standard. Um, you're starting to see some litigation now against uh, organizations. I spoke briefly about the NCAA being named in that uh, suit. Arrington versus the NCAA was a um, class action suit that was settled last year. Um, this is important. Historically, the NCAA has not had a legal relationship with individual athletes. So they didn't, the NCAA doesn't have a duty of care when it comes to um, decisions it makes and a legal effect with regard to any given athlete. Um, but the NCAA had helped fund studies that suggested that there was risk from concussion as early as 2003. And what this case hinged on was that they didn't legislate requirements for schools to have concussion management plans until 2010. So this class action ruling did, it, it funded changes in the way that member institutions perform baseline concussion testing, determine return to play clearance, and it affects created a uniform standard of um, practice for member for medical groups and member institutions. And it also um, created a concussion reporting structure and um, led to some changes in terms of the presence and availability of trained medical personnel at games and practices. Um, similarly, um, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, there was a large settlement in the NFL um, two years ago around concussion litigation and CTE. Um, this, these numbers change with time, um, but as of uh, the time that I put this together last week, um, 4,500 former players have signed on. Um, or, or, excuse me, 4,500 players were part of the initial um, litigation, but over 20,000 have registered since the settlement. About two-thirds of those have ended up dismissed, and, that, and that's that's controversial. Um, there's charges of uh, uh, racial uh, disparities in how those judgments are made. But basically, the NFL um, has accounted for almost $815 million in claims. Um, the settlement has a cap of a billion, so we're coming up on that. In terms of medical disqualification, um, you may not know this, but student athletes don't have a constitutionally protected right to participate in athletics at any level because there's not considered a fundamental right to public education. Um, so that helps you as a physician when you're decision making um, and trying to decide whether this athlete is allowed to play or not. Um, I think the important point to make for you is that clinical practice guidelines and this adherence to a standard of care can defend a physician who decides to medically disqualify an athlete. Um, these are three cases that speak to that. Um, they, I believe most of us are aware of Knapp versus Northwestern. Nicholas Knapp was a basketball player who had um, been recruited and signed with Northwestern. And right before he went to Northwestern, had a um, sudden cardiac arrest. He was uh, revived on court, uh, but never played at Northwestern. Went through uh, multiple appeals, the school, Declined. He was found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and his school declined to allow him to play. Um, he sued, he lost, um, he ultimately transferred to another school. Um, Pahulu versus University of Kansas was an athlete who had a um, cervical canal stenosis and he had an episode of transient quadriparasis on the field. Um, he uh, was medically disqualified by the Kansas team physician. Um, I threw this up here because uh, he went and had three separate uh, medical evaluations by renowned experts in um, re re renowned neurosurgeons, including Joe Torg, all of whom told him he should be cleared to play. The, the physicians at Kansas continued to um, hold his disqualification valid and the courts upheld them. So um, you're ultimately, as the team physician, the one who can thumb up or thumb down an athlete. And um, I think that that's good because you're the one that's ultimately legally liable for them. Um, clinical practice guidelines can be used against a physician who's not following them. Hank Gathers is probably the most cited example of that. 
for those of you who don't know, um, he was a basketball player at Loyola Marymount and had a fatal uh, arrhythmia on national TV um, it, while he was uh, just shortly after he had uh, dunked the ball and was, was turning around to, to uh, play defense. And so um, the thing that you might not know about him is he also had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, the team knew about it. He had been followed by a cardiologist. Um, he was on beta blockers for this. Um, he had argued about the dose that he ought to be on because he didn't like the way that it made him feel. Um, he wasn't taking them properly. Um, he'd had syncopal episodes already. He'd had a Holter monitor that showed sustained VTAC. Um, and so there were a lot of red flags. Um, he wouldn't have been managed the same way today. But when he had his event at the uh, arena, they weren't prepared for it. And he wasn't defibrillated properly. And so, you know, again, it's just sort of a confluence of a lot of mistakes. And in court, the failure of these doctors to adhere to the Bethesda guidelines was ultimately used against them. So ultimately, the team physician has the authority to allow return to competition of an athlete who's been injured or who's been found to have a medical condition that can result in harm. And you know, if you're obtaining input from a consultant for a given athlete's clearance, that doesn't absolve you from liability for a bad outcome. I, I would say that you know, with I'll use hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as an example. Now we're starting to get into dis discussions about. Um, the gradations of this problem and who can play and who can't play. Um, I think it's important for you to keep abreast of this. Um, you're ultimately, you know, somewhat at the mercy of your consultants, but we need to be open to the idea that um, there may be a differing standard for some of these conditions as we go forward. Um, there's a duty to communicate. Um, this case uh, involved a player for the San Francisco 49ers who had Knee, he had no knee injuries and the seriousness of his conditions was underemphasized by his physicians. Um, this was back in the 60s, so uh, he was oftentimes injected with anesthetics so that he could go out and play. Um, he basically uh, trashed his knee and uh, was permanently disabled. And he sued his physicians, um, arguing that they didn't really communicate the extent of his problem properly. And I, I think this is important to hear that a failure to adequately inform a patient with a potentially disabling condition, if you know that they have it and you choose not to tell them about it, that may constitute fraud, not malpractice. And so if that's the case, in that scenario, your malpractice coverage may not apply. So, you know, these are the kinds of the things we learned in kindergarten, right? We, we need to be honest and and do right by people, being truthful with them about where they're at in terms of their medical issues is part of that. Um, an athlete's right to confidentiality is important to understand, especially when you're in a team physician role. Um, remember that uh, they need to consent to, for you to discuss care, especially publicly. Um, a couple things to say about prescribing issues. Um, you know, in terms of delegation of prescribing authority, don't do it. Don't let people uh, prescribe under your name. It's just a bad idea and it's illegal. Um, in terms of who can dispense, um, some states only allow physicians or pharmacists to dispense, but you're responsible for anybody dispensing under your authority. And you need to remember that, especially in a training room situation. Um, Dent versus NFL is a, a suit that's ongoing with uh, 2000 NFL players who contend that the medical care system for the NFL grossly misused um, painkillers and NSAIDs and a lot of this dispensing was going on sort of with the tacit approval of medical staff. Um, if you're the one that's ultimately responsible for that, it's in your best interest to, to make sure that things are being run tightly and appropriately. I'm gonna say a few things about contract negotiation. Actually, it's 250. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bypass this. I'll make my slides available because um, I wanna say a couple things about these DPC, you're going to run into this. So direct primary care involves a contract directly between a primary care physician and a patient for the provision of defined primary care services in exchange for an agreed upon monthly fee. Um, early on, some states viewed these arrangements as a form of insurance and sought to prevent the, the regulatory authority. 
Most states have since passed laws which clarify the practice and free it from the definition of an insurance product. Um, if you practice as a subspecialist, though, you don't necessarily have that carve out. So if your sports medicine practice is not primary care in the traditional sense, then these sorts of arrangements may not be legal. Florida is the only state that, that really is sort of wide open in terms of what it allows. Um, this is something that I think that as a society we ought to work on because I think it, in, with the way that things are going today, um, it's important for us to try to preserve as many revenue sources for members as possible and direct revenue from patients that, that physicians want to contract with is one of those. Um, in terms of corporate practice of medicine, um, each state has a definition in the law of who may practice. Uh, the original intent of these laws was to protect the public um, and they historically also protected physicians. Um, the problem is that most states have allowed exemptions to these over the years and so hospitals and insurers are probably the two biggest examples of who can employ physicians. And so in states with these broad exemptions, these statutes now put physicians in a market disadvantage. They limit independent practices from care integration and, and make them compete with hospitals or insurers for patients and, partner, and physician partners. Um, so um, another uh, approach for our organization, I think, uh, to take is to try to work on legislation to allow more leeway in business partnerships between physicians and non-physicians so that um, we can better integrate care as private providers and compete um, in scope with, with hospital systems or large health systems. Um, a couple points about telemedicine. COVID-19 has obviously expanded this greatly. It's important for you to remember that there are not two legal standards for in-person visits and telemedicine visits. And it's up to you as the evaluating physician to determine where that line is. If it's obvious to you that you're crossing that, you need to pull back and recommend that that patient come in for a physical exam. And also know what your state and malpractice carrier have to say about seeing your own patients if they're in another state. Generally, I believe that if you already have an established relationship with it, that most states most states view that favorably, but you need to check with your own state and make sure that you're not foul of the law. Um, as far as your job in social media, again, never post anything that you wouldn't be comfortable sharing with your employer. Um, the law is pretty well established that the First Amendment does not expressly protect you from the consequences of your own expression. So um, if you disparage your employer online or if you just um, make some half-brained comment that your employer feels like sullies their reputation, they do have the right to fire you. Um, remember that you represent your employer at all times, whether you like it or not. Um, your actions away from work um, may expose you to discipline or loss of your job. And um, employers can be held liable for your posts if they're harmful, which is sort of what the you know, reasoning for these laws go back to. Um, Kyle, I'm going to open it up for questions because I'm running late. Thanks, Chad. That was, that was awesome. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to to pop them into the into the chat. Um, Andy and uh, Brian Williams already uh, put in a couple links in there um, to things that that Chad uh, referenced. Um, Chad, I, I think you actually got to one of. Uh, uh, a, one of the questions that that came up earlier already in terms of what are the next um, next steps for advocacy um, what do you think as far as what can regular physicians do to keep abreast of what those how those next steps are going and potentially help with those well that's and the easy answer to that is uh, get involved with the practice and policy committee through MSSM um, and if you look on the website, uh, there's, there's a state-based right, you know, graphic of the United States. Uh, I believe we still have that, don't we, Andy, where you can look by state and see what is germane to the state that you're in. Um, but the Practice and Policy Committee is going to be the committee that uh, is considering most of what we're talking about and a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about um, st all stuff that's relevant to your practice. And, and again, keep in mind that committee involvement at AMSSM is open committee. And uh, so each of you have the right, and I'd say the responsibility to kind of help with, um, with uh, whatever your area of interest is in AMSSM. Um, 
and if you're if you have an interest in uh, promoting certain public policy then that would be the group to get involved with and brian is the guy that really is the resource for us um, in that area one thing you guys uh you mentioned a, a number of times was just being aware of what your specific state laws are and maybe brian you might have an idea of this too but for e both of you guys what's the best way for our young um young physicians, particularly ones who are potentially moving to a new state to practice, to learn what those specific state laws and rules are. How, do we, how would you suggest that they navigate that? Are, are you asking me? I, I would go to the State Medical Society. If you're, if you're going to uh, set up a practice in a state uh, that, you're, that you're not in right now, the best thing I can do, and Chad, Chad may correct me on this, is just get in touch with the State Medical Society of whatever state you're moving to. They will probably have some sort of a, uh, a resource for you uh, for new physicians moving into the state that will describe all of the you know, legal ins and outs. It, it really is a patchwork. I think Chad explained it well. 50 states. Uh, if you've seen one state, you've, you've literally just seen one state, right? All the states are a little bit different. So it is important to understand your state's uh, the ins and outs of the state regs, the laws, the statutes, the obligations, and so forth. Chad uh, can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, I think, you know, I'd encourage each of you when you get to where you're going to join the State Medical Society in, in your state, because you, not only are you going to have access to information, but you also have access to their lobbyists and um, generally attorneys on their staff that can answer some of those questions for you, and they, they're happy to do that. So, um, you know, some of you will be with large employers and they have you have resources through your employers also, but um, but generally, you know, I encourage especially new physicians to um, participate in their state societies because it's the one lobby group that's all physicians that uh, advocates for your interests, and they do have resources to help you. Great. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I realize we're getting close to the end of the hour. Um, if anybody has any other, other uh, questions, uh, feel free to contact us. Um, Andy knows how to get us our, uh, get you our information. Uh, Dr. Carlson, Brian, thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, presenting today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And, and, you know, I still haven't gotten used to doing a talk where I'm looking into the keyhole of a laptop. I, I'm used to looking at people in the audience, so I don't like this. So, you know, if, uh, Folks are in San Diego and they were here, come pull me aside and say hello because uh, this is pretty impersonal, so. I agree, it takes some getting used to. It's, you, it's really hard to read a room when you're not in the room. <laughs> so I, I thought it was excellent, thank you. Have a good day, guys. All right, take, take care, everybody. Good luck.